Hello everyone. In this screencast we're going to look at DASC's Diagnostic Dashboard. The dashboard is very useful to help diagnose performance issues and help improve your, uh, your understanding of what's happening across your cluster. Uh, it runs by default if you have Bokeh installed. Whenever you run DASC's newer scheduler, the DASC Distributed Scheduler. The schedule is also very commonly used on a single machine and it can be easily started by just creating a client object with no arguments. Uh, all DASC operations use, will use this by default, and the schedule will be created and will be hosted at localhost uh, port 8787 by default. Uh, you can click on this link. I also have it have it here. So I highly recommend having the dashboard available and visible to you while you're working. Here I'm working in a notebook on the left, and I've arranged my screen to have half my screen have the notebook and half the screen have the dashboard. It's very valuable to have the dashboard during computation. It's sort of, uh, sometimes you see people trying to flip back and forth, that seems to be a little bit frustrating. So in the notebook, we have a few computations that are just designed to uh, serve as props. So we don't have to care about them. They're just here to make the dashboard look interesting. So we're gonna start off one of those computations and direct our attention uh, to our first page, the status page, and this central plot to start. So the central plot shows the activity of every thread or every core across our cluster over time. So every line corresponds to one thread, and we see the individual tasks that it's working on over time. So every individual rectangle here uh, corresponds to one task. I'm going to pause it here. And we can zoom in around one of them. So here, this is a task that is a combination of a, an arc sign and computing some random data. And it took around 822 milliseconds. So let's let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, we can use the bokeh plot tools up here. I prefer the wheel zoom. And we can zoom in and, and get sort of a better picture. So here's a combination that's combining uh, a ra creating some random data and computing our cosine. Uh, this purple piece is computing a fused add sum. It took 57 milliseconds. The colors here are grouped by the type of operation. So all of the add sum computations will be purple. It's add sum, add sum, add sum, etc and different tasks with different colorings. The white space here corresponds to dead time. Uh, the worker wasn't doing anything during that particular moment. Uh, so there's you know, tens of milliseconds here where the worker wasn't active. And that's the fault of either computation or of DASC. Uh, it's not able to fill that time. You'll notice at times uh, there's some red that's been overplotted on top of some tasks. Uh, red is for communication. So here we're both computing uh, a random sample uh, arc sign task, and we're transferring some data at the same time. The transfer is taking around 460 milliseconds. The transfer is called a transfer add sum, so it's transferring for an add sum computation in the future. Probably this one, just a few milliseconds later. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of computation, a lot of solid color, which is good. There's a lot of communication happening. If you're seeing too much red, that might be a bad sign. You might want to you know increase your network uh, hardware, or maybe think differently about your computation. Uh, currently, I'm sort of I'm zooming around here, so if this computation is happening, I won't see it, I won't sort of flow through. So I'm going to go up here and press the reset button, and bring it back to the normal view. So let's run that again, uh, and just, again, so if things are happening and I, I decide to pan around, uh, it'll stop progressing, and I have to press here the reset button to, to get it back into a normal, normal state. So let's bring our attention down uh, a little bit lower to these progress bars. So the progress bars are showing you the progress of every individual kind of task. They're color-coded with the same colorings used above. So this add some task and notice is purple, just like we saw it before. And we're seeing the progression uh, from the left not done to the right done. Each progress bar is composed of a few different pieces. Let's break down those pieces a little bit. On the far right of, a prog of some progress bars is a, is a gray piece like this. The gray are tasks that are ready to run. So if we had more cores, these tasks would be running, but they're not being run right now. To the left of that, there is a small colored, solid colored piece uh, here. Uh, and those tasks are the tasks that have been completed and are sitting in memory, so they're taking up RAM. To the left of those, the more transparent piece, are tasks that have been completed, have been in memory, and have been released. So what we're seeing here is sort of ideal. Uh, all of our groups are sort of moving nicely to the right. Uh, there is a small window of tasks that are sitting in memory, but most of the work is, is being released quickly. So we're seeing relatively little 
uh, data that's that's has to stay in memory at any given time. Okay. Speaking of memory, let's look up here towards the top. So this is showing uh, each line here corresponds to one worker. This is showing the amount of RAM that worker is taking up at any given moment. So this particular worker address is taking up 238 megabytes of RAM. All of those are added together here at the top, so it takes about you know, maybe a gigabyte total for our entire cluster. On the right, so these bars will get uh, will change color as we start nearing uh, uh, our memory limits. And you'll start seeing some more uh, orange colored bars show up here in the task stream plot. On the right, you're seeing the number of tasks that are processing. So each of the workers has a backlog of tasks they can run at any given point that corresponds to these dark gray spaces. So you see the workers have 20 tasks that they can run on, 15 tasks that they can run on. What we're seeing here is very nice. Uh, it's a very even distribution between our workers. We would be concerned if some of these tasks, well, maybe these bars are all longer and some of them were shorter. You'll notice as we get closer to the end, some of them go red. So saying, hey, I don't have quite enough work to keep, to keep all, of my, all of my threads uh, fully occupied. So, okay, so this computation looks very good to my eye. It's a lot of solid color. We're using all of our threads very effectively. There's some communication, but it's being very nicely overlapped with computation. Uh, there's very little white space. Uh, we're using all of our hardware uh, perfectly. Uh, let's find a case where that's not true, just for comparison. Here's a case where we're creating a, a random array with 10 million elements. And we're gonna, let's chunk it up into maybe chunks of size, size 1,000. So this is going to be you know, 10,000 small NumPy arrays. Each NumPy array has 1,000 numbers in it. And we're going to compute the sum of that array. So that notice first it took a while between pressing enter and having anything show up here on the right. And then it's also taking around you know, 22,000, 23,000 tasks. So that took around 14 seconds. And what we're seeing here on this task stream plot, we're seeing a lot of red. So there's a lot of time spent communicating. There's also a lot of white, which is time when the workers aren't doing anything at all. So this seems to be an inefficient use of our hardware. Let's zoom in a little bit to some of these purple pieces, and that'll maybe help us understand a bit why things were, were going badly. So if we over over one of these pieces, this is computing you know, a sum of you know, some of those thousands of numbers, uh, and it took around 59 microseconds. So uh, NumPy is pretty fast, and uh, it takes a relatively short time to, to sum a thousand numbers in NumPy. Uh, so we, we call that NumPy function, it takes you know, 60 microseconds, and then it takes us you know, a millisecond or so to schedule our next task, uh, which is going to take another 50 microseconds. Uh, so there's a lot of overhead here uh, that, that Dask is introducing. So Dask is very inefficient when you are doing a lot of very, very, very small computations. Uh, so instead what we might do is we might uh, change our chunking to have fewer chunks but larger chunks. And that might help to, to balance out the computation a bit. So instead of running in 14 seconds, that ran in about a quarter of a second. And so you know our tasks are taking longer, taking in the millisecond range. There's some communication, there's still some white space, but it's a little bit better. Uh, you know, this this computation is actually quite small enough. You really just wanted to use it with straight NumPy. There's no reason to use task here. That is, you know, again, faster still. So uh, let's look at a few more uh, pages here. Let's go over to the profile page. So what we're seeing here in the task plot is a very uh, coarse grained view of how Dasks these things. Uh, every rectangle here corresponds to one task, but we can't get much information about what's happening within that task, within that Python function. What are the various lines of code that are taking up the most time? So the profile page helps us, helps us profile our code at a, at a finer granularity. The profile page is composed of, of two different pieces. Uh, on the bottom here, there's our activity over time. It's a time series. And on the top, there's a, a classic flame graph style plot. Uh, so let's explain both of these in turn. Uh, this time series allows us to select a various uh, region a competition that we've been doing. So you can see the sort of structure here. We've run probably this cell a few times, and this is showing each of those times with some gap in between. A uh, flame graph uh, is uh, a, bunch of a bunch of horizontal bars. Uh, each bar here corresponds to one function. So this rectangle corresponds to the uh, function named apply function, which is in the distributed worker file. Uh, and it takes around 800 seconds overall. This is added up, uh, aggregated across all of our workers. So in wall time, this is around 100 seconds. That function called another function, uh, which is up here, execute task. 
So if a horizontal bar is above another one, that means that it was called within that function. Uh, and again, this function called looks like two functions, uh, execute task and apply. Apply then called sum uh, from numpy and sum called uh, another numpy function named sum. Uh, numpy isn't necessarily the greatest, uh, uh, the most interesting plot to look at. So what we're going to do is we're going to run some uh, some DAS data frame code uh, with Parquet. Uh, this page on the right uh, does not update automatically. It's not going to be live like the previous plots. So we're going to, have to press the update button, and we'll notice is that this new computation showed up over here. So this is much more rich. Okay. And so what we're seeing here is a computation here read data page from Fast Parquet. So on the left here we read some some data from New York City taxicab data set. We had read a particular column and we computed the, the number of passengers in New York City. It took around five seconds. And if we actually look at you know the functions that are that are being run there, it looks like it's mostly taking up this, this read data page function in the fast parquet library in the core.py file, line 99. You can see here the line of code that's being run. Now most of that code is, is, is most of the time is being taken up here. Uh, and it looks like it looks like it, it's a number function. So what we're seeing here is actually Numba's compile stack. If we sort of zoom in here a little bit, we'll see we're taking up a lot of a lot of time, running a lot of Numba code. Uh, the fast parquet library that is used by default by by DAS DataFrame uses Numba to uh, read data from parquet. The first time Numba runs, it does a lot of just-in-time compilation. That's what we're seeing here. So we can actually zoom in on particular parts of this by clicking on a rectangle. So if I click on this rectangle, the entire plot will will change. So that is now the base. So the rectangle that's clicked on is now this bottom line. And I might select maybe this tower of code I'm interested in, and that will again expand out to be the base. So this helps you understand at a very, very fine-grained level uh, what functions are taking time in your computation. Uh, how this works is that Dask, Dask workers maintain statistical profilers on, on all of them. So every 10 milliseconds they check into all the threads and see exactly what functions they're running. So. Uh, what we've seen, uh, I press reset to go back to the, the full page. What we've seen here is that most of the time is taken up by number compilation. Now, if we know something about number, we know that number actually only needs to compile once. So the next time we run this computation, it might be significantly faster. And indeed, rather than five seconds, it's now 1.7 seconds. Let's update. There's now a new computation here. And we can see it's much simpler and mostly just calling some parquet functions. So this can help you get. Uh, a complementary view to what you saw on the status page. In the status page, you th see things at a very coarse level. The profile page, you see things at a very, very fine grain level. Combining the two can give you a lot of information. So uh, let's step back and look at a few other plots here. Let's look at the system plot. Uh, this will tell you information about the process where the scheduler is running. Uh, so we're seeing here uh, that the scheduler has doing sort of a normal baseline level of CPU work. If you run a computation, uh, then very briefly it will spike up as it's scheduling all of those tasks, but it'll get onto a nice, a nice, a nice baseline. Uh, the bandwidth here is measured per machine, so we're seeing all of our workers move data around. We're seeing a few hundred megabytes per second, which is sort of classic for uh, inter-process communication. We can also look over here at the workers page. So the workers page gives us information about all of the workers we have in our, in our cluster. Uh, here, they're all just on my local machine, so it's not very interesting. But you can see their CPU use, memory use, etc. Uh, you can see up here a, a live plot of um, what kind of resources they're taking up. So if we run that computation again, see so the CPU use will jump up, while the memory use will stay uh, more or less the more or less static. Uh, if one particular worker is looking a little bit suspicious, you can select that worker, and it'll be highlighted down here. So you can look into more information for that. If you do want to find more information about that worker, you might also consider going to the info pages. The info pages are not interactive. Uh, this is a more of a static page, but they have a lot of information that's that's fairly useful to, to have. Things like logs for any of the workers or logs for the scheduler. They're busy right now doing some work, so it might take a while for them to show up. But you can also get information about any of the different workers. Uh, looks like they don't really have anything in memory, so let's add a little bit of data in memory for them. Now, when we refresh this page, so again, these pages are not live. You have to press refresh. Now we can see information about what they're, what they're working on. 
We can even look at the call stacks of what they're working on at this moment. So this worker right now is working on this key. And you can see you know, what it's exactly which function it's working on right now. It's like a spending sign doing some NumPy computations. Um, you can also dive into any particular task and you can get a, a much more detailed view of how it, how it works, how much memory it's taking on, uh, the dependencies that it requires to run, uh, the tasks that are waiting for it, and all the various stages. If you're familiar with Dask's uh, internal state machine mechanism, this table can give you a lot of information about exactly how that task progressed throughout the scheduler. So this is a very, very deep dive into the scheduler. You don't have to go there, uh, but it is available for you uh, if you are more of an expert user. Additionally, uh, you can look at, uh, let's, uh, let's delete that. You can also look at the task graph view of the, uh, of the, of the scheduler. This will show you um, all the tasks that are running uh, with edges between them if they depend on each other. So here we have a few data, a few pieces of data in, in RAM. These aggregation co uh, computations depend on others. Uh, let's run this again and we'll see this update live, uh, which would be uh, a little bit pleasant. So you see a new computation running, and you're seeing uh, a sort of a frontier of released data. This blue has been finished. Uh, there's data that's in RAM, and, and RAM that's red, and uh, tasks that are still computing or ready to be computed uh, in green. Uh, we can always zoom in. And if you want to, you can again click on any of these particular tasks. You see the one that's black. If it's if it's you know errored, you can click on it, get more information about that particular task, who is waiting on, etc. So, okay. Um, finally, uh, each of the workers have their own set of pages. So if I click on one of these workers, I've got a different set of pages I can look at to get more information about that worker. So. Uh, here we're seeing um, one the view of one particular worker, how many tasks it has ready to run, the number of tasks it's executing currently. This has only one thread, so it's being pretty pretty well saturated. The communications it has, as well as communications individual data communications it has with other workers. It looks like you know it's sending 40 megabytes to some worker, took around 300 milliseconds, uh, and that ran in you know about 100 took about 100 megabytes per second. So you can dive further on. I'm going to stop for now. Uh, but hopefully these examples give you uh, some understanding about how to use the, these diagnostic pages to diagnose your own performance issues. And by looking at a variety of these um, diagnostic plots, you can get a lot of information about what's happening. Uh, whenever I'm called in to solve a particularly hard problem, I always start here. And by looking at these plots, you get a lot of information. It's, it's much more informative than looking at logs. So thank you all for your time, and I hope this is useful.